So let's look at the nasal con key and discuss what we refer to as reclamation of heat and moisture. If you recall, we have three parts or three regions or three sections to the nasal conchi. The superior nasal concha, the middle nasal concha, and the inferior nasal concha, and the associated nasal meatus. Of course, if we have the superior nasal concha, then inferior to that is the superior nasal meatus. And the same applies for the middle and the inferior conchi. We can see how the nasal conchi are designed or structured by looking at the frontal or coronal sections of the nasal cavity, shown in these two images. So I think it's fairly obvious how the nasal conchi has, again, this scroll-like, it turns, it curves, and the meatus, that hollow tube-like opening through bone, and we also mentioned the fact that it's lined with the respiratory mucosa. There is the superior region of the nasal cavity where we find the olfactory mucosa. And that is within the area of the superior nasal concha. So let's now discuss the reclamation of heat and moisture. Now, it turns out that thermal energy or heat energy always moves in the direction where it is cooler. So heat or something that's hot will always move in the direction where it has a cooler temperature. And a good example of that is if you were to hold a glass of ice water. And the reason why you feel cool or the coldness of that glass when you touch it is because the heat of your hand is moving towards the cooler surface of the glass. Now, this applies to what happens when we breathe in and breathe out through our nose. So let's first look at the inhalation of air. So this top diagram that I illustrated. When we breathe in the air, that air will be cooler and will be filled with particulates. So when we inhale that air, these scroll-like conchi will create a turbulence. And that turbulence will enhance this filtration process. The reason is because the particulates will be heavier. And as it's swirling around these nasal conchi, these particulates will then fall towards the surface of the mucosa, the respiratory mucosa, which again will have a thin lining of mucus because we have those goblet cells, we also have those seromucosal glands, and mucus is sticky. So those particulates will descend, will attach to that sticky surface, which will basically filter out that air. So we filtered the air when we breathe in through our nose. In addition, the respiratory mucosa will be warmer. Remember, you're inhaling that cooler air. So the heat of our respiratory mucosa will move in the direction of that cooler air. And in the process of that happening, evaporation is also occurring evaporation of water, which is the major component of mucus, and the serous fluids as well. So what it does, it will heat up or warm that cooler air and will also moisturize that air. So when that air that we've inhaled through our nose leaves the nasal cavity through the internal nares, it has been filtered, it has been warmed, and it has been moisturized all because of that swirling, turbulent airflow when we breathe in through our nasal cavity. Now what happens when we breathe out or exhale out? The idea is to recapture that heat and to recapture that moisture. All right, so imagine you're now breathing out. That air that you're breathing out will now be warmer. So heat will move in the direction where it's cooler. Well, the cooler surface will be the respiratory mucosa that lines our nasal concha or conchi. So that heat moves towards that cooler surface. And the reason why it's cooler is because it gave off that heat when we inhaled. So that heat moves towards the cooler surface, respiratory mucosa that lines our nasal conchi. And as it does so, water will also condense. Again, think of that ice water in a glass. 
you'll start to notice water starts to condense on the exterior part of the glass. It starts to drip along the surface of that glass. And the reason is because when the heat of the air hits that surface, it causes the water to condense, the water in the air. So that moisture, that water in that warmer air, when it hits the cooler nasal mucosa, it will condense. So when we exhale, that air will be cooler and will be drier. So it's a good idea to breathe in and breathe through our nose. That way we can reclaim the heat and we can reclaim the moisture, much more so than breathing through our mouth. Let's now talk about our paranasal sinuses, often referred to as our sinuses. So these are air-filled cavities that are lined with the respiratory mucosa. They form a ring around the nasal cavities, as you can see with this image over here. And in fact, these paranasal sinuses will ultimately drain into the nasal cavity as well. So we have one that's located in the frontal bone, another one that's located in the sphenoid, another one that's located along the ethmoid bone, and as well as our maxillary bones. And as I said, they ultimately will drain into the nasal cavity. And that opening must remain unplugged and it must remain open. Otherwise, congestion will occur. So what are the functions of these air-filled cavities lined with the respiratory mucosa? Well, they help lighten the skull. They will also help warm and moisten the air and as well as it's a resonating chamber for sound. Please keep in mind that this respiratory mucosa is constantly producing fluid, meaning it's constantly producing mucus and it's also constantly producing the serous fluids through those seromucosal glands. So it must continuously drain into the nasal cavities, as you can see with this image right over here. They all ultimately feed into the nasal cavity, therefore it will always remain air filled. So then what happens if there is inflammation of the respiratory mucosa that line these paranasal sinuses? So as they inflame, the openings will essentially close off because the respiratory mucosa swells, which now creates a blockage to the drainage of that mucus and the serous fluid, leading to a buildup of this fluid. And that buildup, plus the pockets of air, will lead to a sinus headache. So imagine that you're filling a chamber that has air in it with fluid. Where is that air going to escape through? The air can't escape, nor can the fluid. As a consequence, pressure begins to build up in these sinuses, a condition called sinusitis. It can get so bad that the fluid will ultimately have to escape through the lacrimal glands. The lacrimal glands are our tear glands and that feed into our eye. Because of that, that mucus, which has that whitish color to it, will start to accumulate in the eyeball and you can actually see it. Now, usually it's due to some type of bacterial infection. If that's the case, then antibiotics can clear that up. However, if antibiotics cannot resolve it, maybe it's due to a viral infection, for example, or you have constant sinusitis, then a physician will have to actually go in there, drain that mucus, otherwise the buildup will continue. So what we're looking at is a parasagittal section of the left side of the head and neck, which shows us the upper respiratory tract structures. So we have the nasal cavity, something that we've already covered, and the nasal vestibule, the pocket that feeds into the nasal cavity, the scroll-like bone tissue that forms the nasal conchi that are lined with the respiratory mucosa. We, of course, have the superior nasal concha, the middle and the inferior nasal concha, and the corresponding meatuses. We also discussed the olfactory epithelium found at the roof 
of the nasal cavity, which is located in the olfactory region that's associated with smell. And we have an opening whereby air that we've inhaled through the external nares or our nostrils will leave the nasal cavity through this internal nares, also referred to as the posterior nares. And air will then continue its journey through the rest of the upper respiratory tract. And as it leaves internal nares, it then feeds into the pharynx, which is the next upper respiratory tract structure that we're gonna talk about. And we will see that the pharynx is divided into three regions or three parts or three components, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. Now, one structure that I really want to point out is an opening called the laryngeal inlet, okay? So this laryngeal inlet right here that I'm circling right now, that is an opening found in the laryngopharynx that air enters in order to move into the larynx, okay? And this laryngeal inlet, each and every time we breathe, must remain open because if this closes off, that will prevent the flow of air into the larynx, which ultimately feeds into our lungs. However, when we swallow food, we have a flap-like structure called the epiglottis, which I am going to encircle with my red pen. So right there. This flap-like epiglottis will close off the laryngeal inlet when we swallow, whether it be saliva or food or the fluids that we drink, it doesn't matter. So it moves in a downward way, closing off this inlet. Because anytime anything but air enters that larynx, then that officially means we're choking. So the next segment of the upper respiratory tract will be our pharynx, commonly known as our throat. This is a funnel-shaped muscular tube that runs from the base of our skull, in other words, the occipital bone, to cervical vertebra C6. And this pharynx connects our nasal cavity and the mouth to the larynx and the esophagus. The pharynx is composed of skeletal muscle that's lined with the mucous membranes. So the pharynx contains three regions. We have the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. So let's look at the most superior part of the pharynx, and of course that being the nasopharynx. This lies directly posterior to the nasal cavity. So what marks its boundaries? Well, the moment that air leaves the internal nares, meaning it's now left the nasal cavity, is the beginning point of the nasopharynx. So from the internal nares to a structure called the uvula marks the boundary of the nasopharynx. Now what exactly is the uvula? Well, the uvula is the very terminal end or the most inferior end of our soft palate. Anterior to our soft palate lies the hard palate. Now, why is it called hard palate? Because it's made up of the palatine bone. If we look into that nasopharynx, this will only be a passageway for air. So we shouldn't have anything else but air within the nasopharynx. So it's a respiratory mucosa that will contain the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And of course, we can't forget the scattered goblet cells, therefore giving this respiratory mucosa a thin layer of mucus. What we also find in this nasopharynx will be our pharyngeal tonsils, also referred to as our adenoids and the tubal tonsils. So here is our pharyngeal tonsil, and right over here is the tubal tonsil. This tubal tonsil is found around the opening of the auditory tube, also referred to as the eustachian tube. So if we have some type of infection in the upper respiratory tract, 
there is a possibility that that infection can then travel through that auditory tube because there's that opening, once again, found in that nasopharynx. And this auditory tube is associated with our middle ear, leading to a middle ear ear infection. Now, this auditory tube or eustachian tube is important in the equalization of the middle ear. So when we climb a mountain, for example, we can actually hear our ears pop. And the reason for that is because we're trying to equalize the pressure between the middle ear and the atmospheric pressure. In other words, the pressure that is around our body. And the same thing will happen when we descend. So then when we go down the mountain, we're going to hear our ears pop once again because it's trying to equalize the pressure within the middle ear and the atmospheric pressure, the pressure that again surrounds our body. Now, it is important that this uvula closes off the opening leading into the nasopharynx. So what happens is as we swallow, the soft palate and the uvula will actually ascend or flip backwards, meaning it will move in a superior direction. So it moves this way, as I'm trying to illustrate to the left. That way, it closes that opening leading into the nasopharynx and ultimately into the nasal cavity. So what can happen, for example, is let's say you're eating, you're swallowing, and at the same time you're talking. Well, then this uvula does not effectively close off the nasopharynx, and as well as the nasal cavity. Therefore, that piece of food that you're trying to swallow will end up going through the nasal cavity and out through the external nares or the nostril. Let's now look at the next segment of the pharynx, and that being the oropharynx. Now, when it comes to the oropharynx, this is the common passageway for food, fluids, and of course, the air. So unlike the nasopharynx where it's exclusively air, this is not the case when it comes to the oropharynx. So what marks the boundaries of this oropharynx, the middle segment or middle region of the pharynx? Well, it's going to be from the uvula to the hyoid bone, which is found right there. So from the tip of the uvula to the hyoid bone marks the boundary of the oropharynx. So I hope you see that it is a common passageway for the food, the fluid, and as well as air. When it comes to the oropharynx, the epithelial tissue that makes up the mucosa will be non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So what we have here is a transition of epithelial tissue in the mucosa. We went from pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium in the nasopharynx to now non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium in the oropharynx. And why is that? It's because, again, this is a common passageway for not only air, but for fluid and food. The fossas is an opening to that oral cavity. Now, as far as the tonsils, what tonsils are found in the oropharynx? Well, we'll have the palatine tonsil and the lingual tonsil. So here's your lingual tonsil, and right there is your palatine tonsil. The last segment will be our laryngopharynx, the most inferior region of the pharynx. This is also a common passageway for food, fluids, and air. So what marks the boundary of the laryngopharynx? Well, it'll be from the hyoid bone to the very inferior end of the cricoid cartilage. So right there. We'll mark the boundary of the laryngopharynx. This laryngopharynx is divided into two components. Anteriorly lies the larynx. Posteriorly lies the esophagus. This larynx is part of our respiratory tract. In fact, it's part of our upper respiratory tract, while the esophagus is part of the digestive tract. I hope it makes sense that air should be funneled to the larynx, while the substances that we swallow, including saliva, should be funneled to the esophagus.
We should not have anything else enter that larynx but air. And of course, we just talked about in the previous slide the importance of that flap-like epiglottis, which ensures the closing of that laryngeal inlet each and every time we swallow. Now, as far as the type of epithelial tissue that makes up the mucosa, it'll be non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So before we leave this slide, let's identify where we find the larynx, the anterior portion of the laryngopharynx, and where we find the esophagus, the posterior portion of the laryngopharynx. So right here, which I'm highlighting in green, will be the larynx, and this is anterior, okay? And the posterior component of the laryngopharynx will be the esophagus, which I'm highlighting in pink. So right there will be the esophagus. And clearly you can see how this laryngopharynx is a common passageway for both air and for the substances that we swallow.